Welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we will continue our reading of The Demon Priest by Jim Burroughs. Retrospective 4 Farewells, 1941 to 1950. The day that lives in infamy had become its own little corner of dream, a corner in which the bombs fell over and over. People screamed, sirens wailed. Because Pearl Harbor blended in with Guam and Wake Island, Malaya, Hong Kong, and the Philippines, artillery fell as well. Troops landed. War in the Pacific exploded into the dreams and nightmares of so many, over and over. It had been going on for several weeks when Sam made his way in. It wasn't like Alan not to show up at the pub for such a long period, and Sam was worried, so he'd gone looking. The new section had exploded into dream with such force, rending and distorting it, so many people were caught up in its maelstrom that Sam started his search there. He'd walked in on foot, coming down the slope from the mainland to the east, as well as such things can be measured in dream, and found a pandemonium of such a scale that he despaired of finding Alan, even if he was somewhere within it. It was hard to untangle Kulau from Victoria Peak, to separate the conflated dreamscapes. Reluctantly, Sam took to the sky. He tried to resist, but in such a crowded region, control was nearly impossible to maintain, and so he found himself demonic red, with horns and tail and bat-like wings, a demon in the sky over Pearl. He rose above the plains, the myriad uncountable fighters, bombers, the demon wind of death from the sky. Rage began to fill his heart. He closed his eyes and took three deep, calming breaths, a trick he'd learned while clothed in flesh. His mind cleared slowly. He concentrated on riding the currents of the wind, a breeze gentler than the harsh demon wind. He opened his eyes and for just a few heartbeats found himself looking at the weeping, red, long-nosed face of a Japanese kami, also riding the gentle wind, that being nodded and soared away. Rising further above the plains and the fray, he found himself among a throng of barely visible beings, some there in bodies, some just heads, faces, or eyes, all looking on in horror and misery. These, he realized, must be dreamers who'd not been present in the real attack, who lost loved ones, whose hearts were rent. This, he thought, is where he might find Alan. And so he did. Alan, he said gently, but the bishop was unhearing. Alan, more firmly, but still unheard. Alan, nothing. Alan, his voice howled in the tempest wind, and finally the bishop turned. The devil steeled himself and used a voice he despised. Alan, come with me. He beguiled, he enthralled, and reached out his hand. Using the magic of names and his own power of command, he broke through. The bishop looked at him, tears streaming, only the merest of recognition in his eyes, but he took the devil's outstretched hand, and the two sat down in their booth, in the pub, somewhere in Somerset. Betty sashayed over. The usual gents? she asked, and placed the cold pints down in front of them as they nodded. Sam let go of Alan's hand and his mind. It'll be all right, my friend, he said softly. Oh, how I wish that I could believe you, old friend, but I fear it is your guile speaking. The devil shifted to human form so that he could blush. There is some justice to that, Bishop. Please forgive me. The bishop shrugged and stared into his glass. It is your nature, after a while, and I know done in friendship and charity. It struck you hard, that place, that time, that, that it did, Sam. They took my son, gone, lost, only from the world, and from my life. But only your life, not your heart, and not from everything, 
gone in body, but not in soul. Yes, my faith teaches me that, but... And the bishop wept. It'll be all right, reassured the demon priest. They sat in silence and drank a pint and then another. Finally, Sam asked, he left a son, if I remember right. Aye, William, just two years old and will never know his father. But he'll know his grandfather, the bishop sighed. Yes, he will. I must. I owe it to him, to my son and your flock. And my flock? The church has set me out to pasture. They took my flock. But still you are a priest, a bishop. You have a calling. The church gives you no duties, but still you have your calling. A bishop laid his hands upon you as one did upon him before that. That has not changed. No, it hasn't. Then give comfort to the afflicted. Lift what burdens you can. You shame me, devil. Not at all. It is you who challenged me, who shrived, baptized, and ordained me. You helped me find my calling and my mission. If I remind you of what you taught me, it is no shame. And so you bring me back. We must have dreams as well as nightmares, hope as well as regrets. Yes, the bishop sighed. You gave me better hopes, better dreams, how could I not? Time passed. Years passed. The bishop served those that he could and was a constant presence in his grandson's life, in the lives of all his family. The demon priest challenged, taught, and ministered throughout other worldly realms. Still, they met in the pub in dream. I have a favor to ask, old friend, said the bishop to the priest. What is that? I'm getting old. I can see the end of my journey through this life, through that life, the world, that world. Yes, but what wonders may lie beyond, things I'll likely never know. Not truly born, I can never pass on. Perhaps, who knows? Still, I doubt that I will be a presence, a tangible one in William's life, my grandson's life, much longer. That's not unlikely. Would you, could you look in on him now and then? If you think I should. I haven't many friends, mad old Bishop Allen, young boys who know no better listen to their gramps, and others lost in madness or who indulge old codgers. Most of my friends are gone, but you're here for the eons, eh? Something like that. Would you be willing to meet the boy and get to know him while I'm still alive so he knows who you are? After? Of course. Not long after that, Al introduced Sam to his family. Margaret, who had known Sam back in his seminary days, had passed away, and Janet, his daughter-in-law and the boy's mother, had never met him. Alan introduced him merely as Father Samuel. When Janet called him Father Samuels, they didn't bother to correct her, and so they came to know him by that name. Over the next few years, Sam visited often enough that he was a familiar face and presence to Janet and young William. Then, as the middle of the century arrived, Al fell gravely ill. Sam came to be with his old friend. Alan Whitcomb may have been a suspended bishop, but a bishop he was nonetheless, and once he could no longer embarrass them, the church gave him a big funeral at the diocesan cathedral. The graveside service, though, was much smaller, just family and an old friend who said a few words. At the end of the service, as people were leaving, young William approached Sam. You're that Father Samuel, aren't you? asked the boy. That Samuel? asked Sam, taken aback. The one Gramps ordained, Reverend Gregory, the one that vanished, the one Gramps, Gramps claimed wasn't human. He, that he said was the devil. Only once did he ever call me the devil, so far as I know, the day we met. After that, he would have called me a devil or a Grigory. That's a type of fallen angel. But yes, I'm that Samuel. How did you guess? He called you Sam when you were alone and when he didn't see me. 
That meant you were Father Samuel, not Samuels, like Mother calls you. I figured there had to be a reason he didn't use your last name. Well thought out, William. Your grandfather would be proud. He was protecting you, even though you're why he got in trouble. They called him crazy. They suspended him, made him give up his offices. Yes, I didn't learn about it until well after it was accomplished. He wasn't crazy, just honest to a fault. He could have evaded or prevaricated, but that, that just wasn't the man I knew. If he'd had ethics that flexible, he would never have challenged me as strongly as he did, never gotten me to repent, set me on my path. Really? Why? I've been on a mission, ministering to the fallen for decades now. I doubt anyone but your grandfather and me realizes how hard that is, ministering to my sort. People called him crazy because they didn't believe in penitent devils if they believed in actual fallen at all. It takes a very special man to accomplish what he did, something I realize more every passing year. Your grandfather wasn't merely one in a million, closer to a billion, and he was my friend. If anything makes me feel blessed, touched by grace, it's that. The boy started to weep. The devil, being a priest and called to serve, reached out and laid his hand on William's shoulder. I'm sorry, my son. I, William started, then choked. It's okay. I've just never heard anyone speak about him like that. He was my grandfather, and like the father I never had. He, I just look, looked up to him so. He, he was everything I thought made a good man, but no one else seemed to see it. Crazy old Al, the defrocked bishop. They'd humor him, maybe, but... You're right, son. He deserved so much more than that. I wish you could have known him in his prime. It broke something in him when they took away his right to act upon his calling. Thank you. Could you tell me more about him, his story, how you met, how he changed your life? Gladly, said the priest. Then, gesturing to the waiting workman, shall we walk and let these men get about their work? Okay, said William. He nodded to the workman and said in his most grown-up voice, Thank you, gentlemen. He waved to his mother and aunt waiting by the car. His mother tapped her wristwatch. He nodded yes and held up five fingers. She nodded back. As they walked the path among the gravestones, the priest began, I'm afraid that the way we met will take some explaining and may be a little hard to believe. Harder than believing you're a fallen angel or demon? Maybe. It will at least add details that are outside what most people believe. Given what you already know, maybe it won't be as hard. Okay, I guess I understand. Everyone thinks that Gramps was crazy because he believed things no one else does. If he wasn't, then I guess it'll so at least sound a bit crazy. I'll try to listen. Go ahead, start at the beginning. How did you meet? The priest stopped in the shade of a large maple tree. Well, then, we met in dream, which is both a state of mind and a place. Some people, when they dream, their souls, their minds, their spirits, their astral bodies, however you think of it, visit a realm that is called dream. Your grandfather and I both dreamt of a place within that land of dreams, a pub, a pub in a version of a village in Somerset. For him, it was the dream version of Whitcomb, whence your family came. At first we traded jibes, but then, after a number of visits and over a few pints, we got to know each other. We told each other stories, debated philosophy, ethics, and so on. Over dreams of beer? Cider, actually. Somerset is home to some really excellent cider. Eventually, he argued quite convincingly that the fact of my punishment for having fallen, for succumbing to the temptations of the flesh, meant that I had free will, and if I did, then I could repent. From there, it was a natural progression to my repenting, being shriven, then baptized, and eventually ordained. He baptized and ordained you in his dreams? I thought you were ordained in the chapel at... The priest held up his hand. He baptized me not in his dreams. No, he came bodily to dream. 
I journeyed there and met him. I was baptized in person in the land of dream. After that, I came bodily to earth, studied in the seminary, was ordained, and served as a deacon and an aid volunteer in Europe at the end of the Great War and in its aftermath. After he ordained me as a priest, I left for the realms where the fallen are bound. You say that he traveled to dream in his body? Can you prove that? Technically, no, but I could demonstrate that it is possible to travel to other realms and to dream. I'm not certain that I'd be able to prove that it was dream if we went there, not unless you're one of the few that travel there in your dreams. Still, none of that would prove that he traveled there. Would you take me to the realm of dream? How? Walk. We could walk the paths, paths known as the ways between, the pixie, fairy, or witch paths. A friend of mine walked your grandfather there. I've been walking them for a century now on my mission, but I wouldn't want to take you there until you're more grown. There are risks, and time does not travel the same in all realms. You could be gone longer than planned. Like Rip Van Winkle? I'm afraid I do not know that name. It's an old story about a man who wandered into a hidden valley where he met ghosts or fairies or something and drank with them and slept for 20 years. Or was it a century? He woke up with a really long beard in a world that had changed a whole lot since he went to sleep. And that could be based on traveling to Dream or the Halflands, which is what the Realm Between Realms is called. There are risks to such travel. One should not set out of the world that has been one's home without careful consideration. The boy just nodded. Or perhaps you'll find your way to the inn in Old Whitcomb in your dreams. If you do, leave word for me with Betty the barmaid. Just tell her you're Al's grandson. Thank you. Grown-ups don't talk to me like I can understand. You're welcome. I'll come back to see you now and then, if that's all right. Oh, please! Until then, take care, my son, said the devilish priest. Then he stepped to a place where the tree hid him from any eyes but William's and walked out of the world, vanishing in just a pace or two. Chapter 7 Outcasts The next morning, Father Gregory and I were upstairs in the parish house kitchen making breakfast. Well, he was making breakfast, pan bread and milk and honey, when Henri brought up a couple of morning papers. He'd never done that before. I take it there's something I need to see, Henri? I think so, Father. I'm sorry. After breakfast, good enough. That would be more pleasant. Will you join us? Sure, that sounds pretty good. For something out of ancient history? No, nah, just pretty good. I sat another place while they were talking and tried not to think about what they were saying, or the voices. All during breakfast, the papers sat there on the counter, almost screaming out for attention. Bad things are happening, they seemed to call out. When we finished, Father Gregory finally opened them. Each had a front page story about the demon priest taking part in a gang war. There was nothing about how the outcasts had been saving people or anything. It was all just gang warfare and the priest who was revealed to be a demon or the devil himself. That could have gone better, was all he said, though. Somewhere, voices were all abuzz and chattering with fear. It wasn't long until T.C. and Selina knocked on the door to the father's apartment. He invited them in. I see you've seen the news, said T.C., pointing to the papers. Did you know you've got a visitor out front? A visitor? True Blue's sidekick, the True Knight. He's hanging out in front of the main doors of the church. It's kind of like he's standing guard, you know, protecting the city from the danger within. T.C. set his legs wide apart, crossed his arms over his puffed-out chest, and made a sour face. He looked really funny. Well, it would have been funny if you didn't know he was mimicking a really strong, super-powered mask waiting for us outside the door. The father sighed and got up from the table. I suppose I ought to go speak with him. Want us to come down with you? asked Selina. Yes, if you can be really casual. I'd rather not confront him. Oh, I think he'll be doing plenty of that, said T.C. Yes, but let's make the attitude be as one-sided as possible. 
Sure, man. Uh, sure, father, TC replied. The father did that thing where he looks up just a little, like he's reading something. After a couple of minutes, he nodded and started downstairs. We all followed him as he made his way through the cloister, the chapel, and the nave. When we got to the vestibule, he repeated the thing about hanging back and acting casual. I'll just stay here inside, said Henri as he opened the door for the rest of us. There on the path, about halfway from the street, stood that guy, the true knight, just like you see on TV or the web, all dressed in shades of blue with that gold-colored helmet, one of those ones like the original super soldier, Myrmidon, and all those other masks have worn like forever, and his dark blue cape fluttering in the wind. As the father reached the foot of the stairs, he asked, May I help you, my son? He didn't say it very loud, but his voice always carries. Just keeping an eye on you and your gangster friends, demon. The father kept walking toward him. T.C., Selena, and I all stayed back on the steps. Well, you may be disappointed. We weren't planning on doing anything particularly interesting. He shrugged, and from the way he did, I think he was smiling. Although, if St. Michael's is attacked again, I suppose it wouldn't hurt to have a real superhero on site. Where's your partner? She's got business elsewhere. Well, my best to her. Will that be all? No, I just wanted you to know you're being watched, demon. I take it that what I am is more important to you than who, who I am or what I do? In truth, we've dealt with your kind before. I see. The father gave a little nod of his head and made some sort of gesture with his hand. Perhaps someday we'll all judge people not on the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Until then, peace be with you. He turned and came back our way. Or the horns on their head? Pretty sly, suggesting that all that's different is your color. The father turned back a bit and said, You claim to know what is in the heart of another? Without waiting for an answer, he turned back and continued walking towards us, and we could hear him reciting, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. I'm watching you. As the father led us back inside, Maddie, Agent Jardin's voice called from inside, Hello, is anyone there? Henri? Father Gregory? Hello, replied Father Gregory. We walked back into the nave and found Agents Novak and Jardin coming in from the north vestibule. I'm sorry to disturb you, Father, said Agent Jardin as we met halfway in the middle of the church. It's quite all right, Special Agent. How can I help Falcon today? We've been getting a number of inquiries about you after the news coverage. Several masks were asking about your status and ID. You are not registered as a vigilante or a mask with a secret identity, and there are a few irregularities with the ID you were carrying when we questioned you. We had to disclose that you were unregistered, and the news about your background brings your birth date, etc., into question. We came by to let you know. As we were arriving, we were informed that the true knight had paid you a call. I believe he is still out front. Did you ask him to vacate your property? No, ma'am. It seemed like that would only increase the chance of confrontation. It probably would. We could speak to him on your behalf, ask him to stay off your property, if that would help. Not presently. That leaves us with your ID. It would appear that some of it is false without being a registered cover identity. Looks like the household's work. I expect that if we inquired, they would say they'd look into it and then after a while come back with paperwork that had been in process all along. Still, you're in violation of Falcon regs and probably state or local laws if you used the same ID when McGarry questioned you. I see. I'm not familiar with the regulations in this area. I will see to the proper paperwork being filed if you will allow me the time. Please do. The situation at that warehouse was not good, and you appear to have been... She stopped and smiled, a real smile, like pizza night, like she was holding back a laugh. Sorry, I was about to say on the side of the angels. Let's try again. The right side, in that one, in that one so we can cut you a bit of slack. So still, the registered paralegal groups and independents have the right to inquire about you, and they may act based upon the ambiguity and incomplete record, 
there's some public concern around about my sort just walking around. She really looked like she was choking down a laugh or something. Well, yes, remember you're not a protected class that I'm aware of, so it's probably not technically a discrimination issue, but yes, your um, background seems to have set a few people off. Just then there was a thump out on the front lawn and we all turned in that direction. What was that? I asked. It sounded like a couple hundred pounds landing from a few hundred feet up. Probably a meta, a clumsy flyer or a leaper, replied Agent Novak. Shall we see? asked the father. Maddie sighed. I suppose we must. And we'll find out what went thump in the front yard next time.